because the more we record. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Lutinen. Uh, I would just let you know that we will start in a couple of minutes and uh, also letting you know that this uh, presentation is being recorded. And I will let you know exactly when we start, probably about 12.02 or 12.03 until everybody is on board. Jim Hemseth, did you have a question? You can unmute if you want. Just want to say good morning. <laughs> good morning, Joe. <laughs> Why is it so early out? <laughs> well, only in Alaska is it really early. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. We got like our 15 hours of daily already, so it's been sunny for a, for a long time. But the fact that it's sunny also means it's 10 degrees out. Okay. Well, welcome, Jim. Glad you're here. Well, you know, any chance to, you know, glean from the best of the best, I'm there. Now I can go back and eat my breakfast. Okay. <laughs> Mute me away. Right. Uh, known, uh, this is Dr. Lutinen. Uh, I'm the director of the Doctor of Business Administration program here at the Weather School of Management at Case Western Research University. And I welcome you to this uh, information session about our uh, EPA program and also uh, having presentations on critical issues and topics around uh, digital innovation and how we handle that in our program. I'm going to do a short introduction of our, of the, our program uh, attendees and the speakers, and then we will have the presentations uh, which uh, belong to this webinar. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, I'd just like to introduce some of the staff which is involved uh, and participates in this session. We have here Dr. Phil Kola, who is the Associate Faculty Director and teaches in the program and guides a lot of students. In the program, we have the Managing Director, Sue Marker, who if you plan to apply for the program uh, later on or have already done so, you will be contacting and directly interacting with her. 
And, and we have also Marilyn Horman, Associate Director, who handles many of the student administration issues, and Shelly Monichi, who uh, is a department administration and handles many of the practical arrangements around the uh, residences and many other numerous things. In this uh, program, uh, uh, as to what follows, we will have two presentations, uh, one from the faculty uh, who teaches in the program, and another one from an alumnus uh, and on a similar or related topics. And I'll introduce both of them next. Uh, uh, the, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Yonji Yu. She, he is Elizabeth M. and William Troyhaft Professor in Entrepreneurship. And he's also the uh, faculty, uh, faculty director of the DI at the Department of Design and Innovation on, uh, on XLAB. And XLabs is a laboratory which is partnering tech savvy students, faculty, and industry experts, uh, and which uh, seeks to understand, adopt, and implement new business models and compete in the new digital economy. Dr. Uh, uh, you also teaches in the program one course which focuses on design and digital innovation. Uh, and the second speaker who we have today is uh, Mike Fisher. Uh, he is currently the uh, Chief Technology Officer of Etsy, which many of you know, and he has a long uh, uh, history of engaging in uh, consulting and uh, dealing with all types of large-scale digital initiatives, either as a consultant or as a, as a managing director, as he currently does in uh, Etsy. Um, and he has, <clears throat> and you can see that he has had several uh, roles as a Chief Technology Officer of the PayPal and so forth, and many other types of roles. He finished in the, our program uh, his PhD in 2011 on network effects uh, and their application in how to grow uh, digital businesses. And you will hear about how he has applied these teachings in his uh, career later on in consulting and then at Etsy. And without further ado, uh, uh, I will let uh, Dr. Yon Jing Yu to start uh, make his presentation, which will go about 25 minutes or so. All right, uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Kali, for the uh, invitation and, and also uh, the introduction. So uh, we only have 25 minutes, it's a big topic. So I'm gonna jump right into the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so the topic that I'm gonna share with you today is, uh, is an idea that I've been working on over the last few years and still working on it. Uh, it's the idea of how the way we organize ourselves in firms and businesses are changing or needs to change as we see different kinds of uh, technologies emerging, uh, which I characterize as an organic machines. Um, so, um, uh, you know, just stepping back and looking at a, a big picture, historical picture, the, our species, Homo sapiens, has built the civilization um, by overcoming our uh, inherent weaknesses uh, through uh, technology and our collective actions and organizing. You know, by no means, any means we, we are not the strongest uh, species on earth from a simple physical uh, strength, uh, yet we are uh, the, the dominating uh, species on earth. And uh, the technology is a combination of um, uh, actual matters and then form to create certain uh, functions to enhance uh, and uh, expand our uh, innate ability. So that's what one of the things we use on the other hand, we also uh, have an ability to mobilize people uh, in a much larger group of people to work together to uh, get certain uh, shared goals done. But at the core, what we have is this symbolic meaning. So we share meanings. Uh, we, we are not just creating um, organization because we, we uh, live together. We create certain meaning around say, we are in the same um, uh, country, we are in the same religion, or we are all, you know, uh, fans of Cleveland Indians and so forth, that creates some kind of shared understanding, shared goals. Technology is the same thing. You know, the, the combination of form and function does not necessarily lead to certain function. We create meaning of that particular tool and symbolic meaning, and that allows us to use the tool in combination as a, uh, as a, a collective action. And then we can uh, create a much stronger uh, uh, ability to change the world in which we live. So with that, so the technology, uh, the evolution of technology and our ability to organize ourselves are intimately interconnected in our ability to advance our society and civilization. And the main argument here is that I see the technology that we use are, uh, are changing in a very 
uh, 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 distinct way in a way that we never had before. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what I'm um, uh, referring to uh, as uh, 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 organic machines. So we are, I would argue that we are entering into an organic machine age. What do I, uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you may think that I'm talking about AI, which is a part of it. You know, Facebook uh, created a robot and, and it started speaking its own language and nobody understood what the hell it was talking about. So they quickly shut it down. But actually, we have a much more mundane examples of uh, or what I would call uh, organic machines. For example, this is a uh, uh, Amazon uh, homepage that I visited yesterday. Uh, I don't know how often you go to uh, Amazon website. Uh, if you are Amazon Prime member, and if you go there twice a day, <clears throat> you will get different uh, display every time you visit the website. Amazon is designed to give you different look and feel each and every time you visit. Everybody gets different home uh, homepage, and it is by design. Uh, I show you two different uh, uh, social media. One is uh, Twitter. Uh, the other one is Facebook. When you go to Twitter and Facebook timeline, they never give you the same uh, screen twice. It's by design. It's almost impossible to have the same static page on Facebook if you stay on their main product, which is their timeline. Twitter is the same thing. Again, this is by design. This is a machine that is never repeating itself by design. It constantly doing something different, producing some different looks and feel and function with ourselves. Now, mostly these kind of examples that I gave you are remaining in the uh, specific individual digital service. So in a way, we have perfected a way of creating a organic non-repeating machine in a pure digital space. Now that's not all. Uh, here's another example, Google web page, right? If you do search, so just like any, uh, you know, um, uh, any academic, I uh, uh, Googled myself on a Google to see, and, and I found that there are 443,000 results. Uh, now that results, if you go all the way down to the last page, will constantly change. And that is because there are different links that are being made every day on the internet, which, has, which Google has no control over. I have no control over. No one on earth has control over these websites being created. Therefore, the search results of Google is reflecting that by creating something different each and every time. Now, all of these examples are pure, uh, 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 the digital service domain, but think about um, a product, physical product. Apple's iPhone is connected to an in incredibly large and dynamic uh, organic space called App Store. The App Store every single day receives different apps coming in and are being approved, being rejected. That app space is changing. So what is an iPhone in a very simple way, smartphone? It's a, a hardware that is connected to incredibly expensive space that is constantly reinventing itself in, in the name of app store. And depending on what app you use, the behavior and function of the, the, the same hardware, it's changing every single time. Now, sooner or later, I believe that we will enter into an organic operating system where the app store and operating systems are integrated so that I don't even need to think about app store. Simply app, the, the operating system will just suggest what app should I use? And every single time I go, I can give you an example going on and on and on. So what is happening? Uh, we are, uh, the, our current economy, the old industrial economy was built on inorganic machines. Now we are entering into this organic machines. Organic machines are already in part around us. And what is going to happen over the next you know, decade or so is a full blown evolution of evol the organic machines that are, uh, that which will be the core of our economic activities. So what do I mean by actually organic machines? So uh, the organic idea, the organisms uh, coming from the work of uh, Bergeson and Deleuze uh, and they talk about organisms in the, in the biosphere, in, the, in biology, in nature. So how do they make a distinction between inorganic matter and organic life? This is their uh, uh, definition. Inorganic matters are characterized by repetition or near repetition, 
where separated elements are rendered capable of returning to previous states or directly anticipating states to come. These repetitions, past and future, are already contained within the present. Observing their con current configurations long enough will give you a, a capacity to understand their future arrangement. So if you have a rock in your, in your garden, the rock is going to remain as a rock and, and, and retain its property. And therefore, unless there is an exogenous force picking it up and moving it somewhere else, we can actually predict what the rock would look like based on the erosions and so forth. So this is the basic definition of inorganic matter. So then what is organic life? Organic life is a complex fold of chemical and physical that reveals something not given within them. Something new, emergence, life that access with matter that seeks to extend matter beyond itself, its present form is not the origin of the virtual, but rather one of its modes of actualization, the potentiality of matter itself insofar as matter is the material of life as well as non-life. So, you know, these people, the Deleuze and Bergson, these people were struggling to understand how the life began on earth. And when you think about life on earth, organic lives, they are the one which actually consume energy from outside so that its current state is going to change in, an un, uh, in a dynamic way, a non-linear way. In a very simple way, that's what life means. That's what organic uh, uh, life uh, uh, organisms uh, mean. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take that idea directly into the understanding of technology. I'm going to uh, skip through some of these slides, go straight into what I mean by inorganic and organic machines. So if I just take their definition of inorganic matter and applying it in inorganic machines, inorganic machines are the ones that we are very familiar with. These are the machines characterized by repetition or near repetition whose future state can be predicted with enough observations. If you have a hammer, if you have a big machine, if you have a car, these machines, their behavior, their future state can be predicted and because they are supposed to repeat itself again and again and again. That's how we built our uh, uh, industrial ecosystems, both as a tool to produce, as well as an outcome of our production. The product used to be an inorganic machine that enhances end users' lives. So what is organic machines? Organic machines are complex folds of hardware, software, model, and data connected through procrastinated and temporary binding, which I will explain later, in runtime that reveals something not given within them, something new, emergence. So organic machines is the, the hardware, software, and model, and data. And then here, as I mentioned earlier, the way the inorganic matter becomes life living organism is injection of outside energy into it. So that the, 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 the state actually is uh, uh, growing. So in orga the organic machines is the same thing. So what is the energy here? It's the data that comes in that creates, animates what is previously there in a new different form uh, that has not been given uh, at the beginning. So this is very simple. What do I mean by the procrastinated temporary binding? When you think about computers in a very simple way, computers don't have everything that it needs to perform by design a priori before the runtime. The, the Zoom that you're seeing now has uh, uh, the, the algorithm. It is receiving input data from my microphone and uh, my camera. And then uh, it is using the hardware and it is constantly performing a runtime calculation to bring all these inputs together to produce certain outputs. And that combination of hardware, data, and, and software uh, is only temporary because once that calculation is done, once that result is used, it is busy moving on to the next task and the next task and next task. So the binding of all different materials are procrastinated means that it is waiting until the runtime. It is not done a priori. And then it is temporary because once the execution is over, it move on, moves on to the next task. 
And it's a very complicated uh, theory, uh, but we don't have time, a whole lot of time to explore it. But this is a very fundamental aspect of uh, computational technology. So what does this mean then? The organic machine is always emergent, performative, as the present being is one of its many possible modes being actualized in runtime. So my machine, my hardware connected to the internet could have been in many different, different states. Somehow I chose it to be in this particular form in its current form. Now, this is not autonomous. I chose it to behave in this way, but increasingly this combination is going to be done autonomously or uh, either uh, or by design, but the, the outcome of that combination is likely to be emergent and, and, and uh, nonlinear. So, so what is the future of a firm with these organic machines in the center of their uh, value creation process? So we all know what industrial firm uh, looks like. Uh, it looks like this. They go to transform raw material from the nature commodity into marketable goods and services. And the process that we convert the raw material into marketable goods and services is called value chain. At the core of the value chain is inorganic machines that are supposed to perform the same task again and again and again in big scale. That's what industrial form is. Our entire understanding of industrial economy is rests on this simple model. Michael Porter's value chain and five forces are based on this idea. The idea that the industry is separated, vertical industry is centered around a product, a product that is supposed to repeat its function again and again and again is so crucial in our understanding of the way we think about organizations, business organizations. Now, this here, what they do is what I would call permanent and early binding of form and function. So when they produce a product, say that's a car, what the car looks like and what it does is decided at the end of this uh, value chain process way before I use it. So it is one, and then that combination is permanent. You know, once you get a car, the combination of all the pieces and parts are permanent. And that is done at the factory at the end of the manufacturing process. So this is why I call it permanent early binding. And the, the process of value creation is to create uh, goods with irrevocable status because it's permanent and, and the process is irreversible. Once you use an iron uh, metal to produce a sheet metal to create a body, that process is not reversible. That's done. You use that uh, material once and for all, unless you recycle it. However, what we're going to see is in the future is an algorithmic firm performing nonlinear value creation process using organic machine in the middle in runtime. So this is a, a, the framework that I use all the time. So what I call digital uh, value loop. So here we see the bi biosphere, which is a physical world and then digital world, what I call infosphere. And then here we take actions with the physical products, but they generate data that produces the input into the, uh, the, the, the virtual world. Uh, and then the, there, there, the new combination of form and function happens in runtime, shaping our experiences with the product and services. So this is essentially a nonlinear repeating loop as um, uh, which the, the, the value uh, of which is uh, growing as people uh, repeatedly engage with these uh, services and products over time. So what does it, does it look like? So value co-creation in a, a digital value loop is an on-demand, it is deferred, it's temporary, it's a recombinatorial configuration of all kinds of different materials and non-material resources, hardware, software, data, and algorithms. And through the live action, this is the key. It is a live action of software uh, enabled uh, algorithmic instructions. So, so this is essentially how the, the, uh, the organic machines are orchestrating our activities between the tools and collectives to create different value in our lives over in this uh, emerging um, uh, economy of uh, organic machines. 
Again, uh, uh, we talked about procrastinated as temporary binding as a key to understand uh, this uh, reversible recombinatorial process that is, uh, that is a key to the uh, digital economy. And uh, a product here is a run uh, in a runtime economy is a computational performative enactment of resources that are available. What I mean by that is that uh, when I use iPhone, the, the behavior of iPhone is a live action. It's a performative. It is, it is once that particular moment it is executed and it does not necessarily repeat itself unless that particular condition uh, requests that exact same performance again. So if, if something happens, the same thing twice, it is not by design, but it is by either choice or by accident. Uh, because that particular contingency requires the same behavior of the machine and, and uh, it is not by design. So uh, the future of a firm is an excess of organic machines, uh, many different types of algorithmic machines that constantly generate uh, new value by transforming insights that we generate inside that uh, infosphere and then uh, 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 creating particular combination of physical and, and non-physical resources in a temporary and situationally meaningful way so that users will actually uh, benefit from that particular combination that is given to the user at that particular moment. And then the, you know, the, the, the way the firms will compete will be based on how precise uh, that uh, understanding is and how peculiar and contingent that offering is. Uh, the, you know, the more precise and peculiar and contingent their offering is, more value that they will create. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, to me, the, in the future, uh, the product is not a complete product. It's, a, it's not completed artifact. Rather, we should think about a product as an option. Uh, it gives you an op me an option of enacting different kind of behaviors and the, the richer that possibilities are from that option, the better the product is. So, uh, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, the regular feature phone and smartphone, the difference is that I'm not just buying features that are prescribed in its current form. What I'm actually purchasing is the future options that I can enact different performative action of the product in the future when I want to. And that is the key. That's how we are changing the way we produce value in the economy. So with that, uh, I'm gonna stop here. And if there are any questions or comments, i uh, love to entertain. And otherwise I will just hand it over to Kali. Great, thank you, Young Jin. Um, there, I believe there is one question from an attendee that I will unmute. Um, so you can either raise your hand for one or two questions here, or you can, continue to put your questions in, in the uh, Q&A section. So one second here and... And okay, Dan Healy, you are free to ask your question. Let me unmute here. Can you hear me okay, Young G? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to say thank you for your uh, for your presentation. Really, really interesting. And I wanted to ask you a question. I work for a German software company. The uh, company is SAP. And we have introduced over the last three years uh, this, this topic, this concept called the intelligent enterprise, which I actually think it, it, almost, it, it almost sort of bolts into your presentation on organic um, really uh, computing and the, and the concept behind the intelligent enterprise is a full integration suite of both hardware and software, um, you know, uh, feeding processes related to automation, innovation, optimal experiences, and, you know, ultimately helping enterprises be more um, data driven, um, you know, again, with like AR, ML, et cetera, et cetera. We're focused on a concept on the HR side. So for the last 20 years, I've worked in HR, um, total rewards, uh, recruiting, um, and change. And uh, we're, we're focused on this, this concept of um, augmented humanity, augmented humanity. So the idea of augmented reality, but can we, 
can we help em employees? Can we help managers make better decisions to take care of their customers, um, to, to be better managers, to be more inclusive, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, we're on this, this, uh, this, this drive, I guess, to, to look at augmented humanity, on, you know, on the basis of, of edge technologies. And I just wanted to get a sense from you based on your research, you know, how, how does this impact the human, the human factor? Um, decision making, empathy. Um, you know, when we talk about, you know, really this intelligent enterprise and these technologies. So um, that was my question. Again, thanks. Really outstanding um, update, and I and I I've learned so much. Well, thank you for the question. Um, so my quick, uh, you know, I I, I probably want to uh, just go to this uh, slide here. Um, you know, the, throughout human history, uh, the the humanity has always been augmented. Uh, I think uh, we, we are very weak species. We would uh, not survive if, uh, you know, we are not physically augmented, right? You know, like, uh, that's why we have to wear clothes. That's why we have to wear, you know, live in a house. And so uh, it's always augmented. The question is, and then that the, uh, we also augment ourselves with others. Uh, and, and so this is why I think it is so crucial to understand. So I don't think that changes. What is changing is the nature of the technology, which, uh, in, uh, in my belief, uh, 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 had you know uh, you, uh, used to be inorganic. So we we know what this thing is going to do, and we know we design a hammer with a certain weight and certain you know uh, size of uh, handles and so on. So we know what it does, and we know how to use it. We we can master it, and then with that we can create uh, you know. Uh, um, you know the all these uh, um, uh, organizing, uh, you know, uh, structures to leverage it in a big, uh, uh, big organized manner. Uh, so I don't think it really changes in uh, in any fundamental way. Now, for uh, people like us who focus on technology, uh, we can just take our eyes off uh, from the fact that all of these are meant to be augmenting human uh, at the end of the day, human ability, human experiences. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, my argument is that, uh, you know, that, that requirement of uh, human centric and then, um, and, and, and also the, the, uh, the, the understanding that the tool exists for people, not the other way around, uh, is so, so important. And even with these organic tools, that question is, uh, is uh, you know, I, I think is becoming even more complicated because the technology is constantly evolving. So how can we make sure that evolutionary trajectory of the technology is not in such a way that it is harmful rather than, um, you know, helpful for our humanity and our human values? I hope that an answers the question, so. Thank you much, really helpful. Thanks. Um. Young Jin, we have one question in the um, in the Q and A, and this will be the last one for you now. But people can keep putting them in. But from Jim Hemstad, who says, "What do you think is the next management theory that will define what an organization looks like and what the organizational behavior needs to be?" Well, uh, that's a million dollar question, right? You know, <laughs> so. Uh, if I uh, so there's a lot of different theories of uh, of firms, uh, you know. So uh, you know, uh, economists love to see firms as a collection of contracts. Uh, some people look at firms as a bundle of resources. Some people look at firms as a bundle of uh, uh, routines. Um, and 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 in, depending on where you're coming from, uh, they will continue to be right. You know, because uh, the fundamentally, the, the idea of a firm doesn't change. I think what we will need is looking at firm as a nexus of algorithms. I think that will be a new frontier of understanding the nature of a firm, which will not complete. None of these theories are complete in their own. Uh, and I, I think that's, uh, you know, that will be an interesting one. A side note to that is that there is a lot of discussion about platformization and uh, you know platform as a as a theory. I think they are fundamentally wrong-headed uh, to be controversial. Uh, I think the uh, if you just follow the economic logic and then if you actually pay attention to what is happening in the real world, we are seeing a lot of uh, you know 
de-platformization uh, taking place. So Disney is vertically integrating, Apple is vertically integrating, Tesla is vertically integrating. Uh, so um, the, the, we have seen what is possible with digital technology and the generativity and all of that, you know, lateral thinking through platform, but you know, they are leaving too much money on the table if you just follow the logic, you know. And so the firms who are profit-seeking entity will try to find its way to revert back to some form of vertically integrated organization. And, but that vertically integrated new form of hierarchy is going to be vastly different than what we had before. Uh, so again, that I'm going back to the algorithmically controlled vertically integrated hierarchy is likely to be the next big organizing structure. I think that we will likely to see. Uh, and that will be my bet if I bet my $5. So with that, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Young Jin. Um, we, again, if you have any more questions for Young Jin, put them in the uh, q and I'll ask Young Jin to look at those as we move on to the next part. Kali, it's all yours. Yeah, our next speaker will be uh, Mike Fisher, and uh, Mike, you can just go on. I already introduced uh, you, so there's no need to do anything else. Okay. So funny, good to hear you from you and what your experiences have been and how you got leveraged the, the education you, you gained uh, through the program. Awesome. Thanks, Kelly. Um, hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. As Kelly mentioned, I'm currently the CTO at Etsy. And I graduated the Weatherhead PhD in management program in 2013. Uh, Kelly was the chair of my dissertation committee. So for that, I will always be very, very grateful. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about my research and how I've leveraged that in some roles since graduation. Um, while I was in the doctoral program, I ran a consulting firm with a longtime friend and fellow student. And we were technologists by training. And we had helped build and scale some really, really large tech firms. Um, and our consultancy would help companies scale their organizations and their technology. We wrote several practitioner books about scaling. Um, and when we entered the Weatherhead program, we wanted to be practitioner scholars. And we wanted to be able to, what that mean, meant to us was we wanted to be able to conduct independent research leverage that research as well as other scholarly research like what you just heard and put that into our practice and take that out to practitioners and teach them how to do that. And one of the companies that I got to work with as a consultant was Etsy. Um, we'll get to Etsy in a minute, but first let me talk about my research in the program. So when I entered the program, what I was interested in studying was why some two-sided marketplaces grew so rapidly while others failed. And if you're not familiar with the term two-sided marketplace, it's a platform having two distinct user groups that provide each other with network benefits. And these include social media sites like Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, as well as e-commerce or marketplace platforms like eBay and Etsy. I chose to study a group of social media platforms that included Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, Friendster, and a bunch of others. And as you, you know, might suspect, some were wildly successful and others not. And as a technologist, I thought for sure there was going to be a technical answer to this. But like most interesting hypotheses, this was wrong. The factor that actually made some of these marketplaces more successful, what we found was it revolved around self-identity the greater extent that users were allowed to express their self-identities, the greater success of that social media platform. And while most platforms had similar features or what we might call feature parity, what really differentiated the success were the ones that allowed users to misuse or misbehave with their features to express their self-identity. Now, self-identity is a quality that makes a person different from others Stryker and Burke defined it as parts of a self that are composed of meanings that a person attaches to multiple roles that they typically play in societies, right? And you can see this concept of multiple identities coming about in this definition. And there are, of course, a number of theoretical frameworks that explain why and how people express their self-identities, such as the theory of information sharing, 
that states sharing information contributes towards the formation of a person's self-identity and arises from the need for self-expression. So one of my favorite examples of the misuse of a social network's features to express someone's self-identity involves pets, of course. So when social media was new, right after pet owners set up their profile, they wanted Daisy to have a profile too. Now, of course, Daisy didn't really care about this, right? But this was a way for people to show their self-identity as pet lovers. Friendster, one of those social media platforms, found out about these accounts and called them fakesters. And they shut them down because they were misusing the product, right? This was meant for people, not pets. And they shut them down. Facebook, on the other hand, encouraged this behavior. And they actually allowed a subgroup to be formed called Dogbook. And in 2010, that subgroup alone had over a million users. So how did this turn out for Facebook and Friendster? Well, most of you are still familiar with Facebook, probably still use it, while many of you don't even remember Friendster. And if you do remember it, you definitely still don't use it. By the way, this graph stops in 2009, because if it didn't, that red graph, which is Facebook, rises so far that the blue graph, Friendster, would look like that green graph, MySpace, just completely flat. And Friendster was formed in 2003, and at one point, it had over 100 million users. But by that behavior that we just you know, sort of profiled, by 2009, it was valued at less than 5% of its original value. It was acquired for $26 million, and in June of 2018, it closed down as a company. Now, Facebook, on the other hand, is valued at over $800 billion, and it's on its way to that elite $1 trillion valuation. Now, since we're in tax season, another favorite example comes from Intuit's TurboTax. If you're not familiar with TurboTax, it's one of the leading online tax softwares. Many of us use it to produce our, our state and federal tax filings. Now, something called Live Community, TurboTax Live Community, started as an experiment in 2006 as part of this TurboTax online product. And the engineers at Intuit started by placing what's called in-product search, these little search boxes on each page of the product workflow. And it was designed to help users find answers to their product-related problems. The expected usage of the search box was for users to enter a few keywords, just like you would on a you know, search engine like Google, in order to find answers that Intuit provided about the product. But the engineers soon noticed a problem. The number of no results found for this contextual sensitive searches were higher than they expected. When they started analyzing these results, they found that many of these failed searches included multiple sentences ending in questions. So the users weren't asking questions about the software, they were actually asking tax questions. And so the Intuit team worked to implement a solution that would allow for these individuals to not only ask questions, but to actually answer them. And in 2011, 9 million users found over 25 million answers to questions posted to the live community with 65% of those answered by non-Intuit employees. So this is a super interesting case about product misuse. But what about people expressing their self-identity, right? That's what I sort of you know, said at the beginning that this is all about how people express their self-identity through misuse. Well, Intuit's engineers began looking at live community data. And they noticed that the one particular person with a username BWA had answered nearly 84,000 questions and had over 11 million views on their answers. Now think about that, if each question took just a minute to answer, which these are tax questions, so they don't take just a minute to answer, all 84,000 questions would take 35 weeks worth of work to complete. So this leads us to the question of why would we invest so much time on this platform? Why would this user, BWA, invest so much time on the platform without getting paid? And it turns out that this person was a retired CPA. And their self-identity was in large part that of being a CPA. They saw themselves as a CPA and they wanted others to see themselves as that. Now the live community platform had a mechanism where members could vote to say the answer was helpful or the question was solved and even give thanks to someone for answering the question. And each vote represented the validation of BWA's proficiency and their identity as a very knowledgeable CPA. So we ultimately wrote a book about this um, the ideas of allowing customers to misuse or misbehave when you're using your products. 
Uh, the book is called The Power of Customer Misbehavior, and it's a practitioner um, you know, a, a book about how to implement this. And this concept was also picked up and given a chapter in what has become a best-selling product management book by Marty Kagan um, that's called Inspired, How to Create Tech Products That Customers Love. So in 2017, as a consultant, when I completed the, the PhD program, um, I was asked to come back to Etsy during a leadership transition and do some consulting. And after a few weeks there, I was asked to stay on board as their full-time chief technology officer. And in large part, because of their mission, supporting creative entrepreneurs, I agreed to stay. And if you're not familiar with Etsy, it's a global marketplace for unique and creative goods. We have over 4 million sellers, 81% of, of which are women, 97% work from their home, their kitchen tables, their garages, their dens. They list over 85 million unique items and they're sold to 82 million buyers. And in 2020, this past year, we experienced triple digit growth with over 10 billion in gross merchandise sales and 1.7 billion in revenue. We are champions of diversity. 33% of our engineers are women, which is almost double that of industry. 35% are URM. Four out of seven of our executives are women. And we have gender parity on our board of directors. So fast forward to March, 2020, just about a year ago, shortly after the pandemic hit in the US and personal protective gear was in very short supply. The CDC gave guidance that any mask could help prevent the spread of this disease and overnight shoppers scrambled to find cloth masks. On Etsy at this time, if you search for mask, you were gonna get either a Halloween mask or a facial cleansing mask. But our sellers immediately noticed this and they began making cloth protective masks. Seamstresses who the day before were making wedding dresses were now sewing masks. So Etsy, we, you know, as the executive team had a decision, allowing people to make and sell masks could be a liability. If they made, made a, if, you know, they might make medical claims or something like that, sellers could get quickly overwhelmed by the number and not be able to ship the mask for weeks, which would be a horrible buyer experience. The marketplace was really not intended for this use, but the buyers and the sellers wanted to misuse the marketplace for this. So we let them. We quickly put in place some guardrails for medical claims, fulfillment, and other issues, but we mostly let the buyers and sellers do what they wanted to do, buy and sell masks. And so you might be asking yourself, all right, so the mask story involves self-identity. You know, wh what about this mask involves self-identity? I get it that it's misuse of the product, but you know, I talked about people misuse it in large part because they want to express their self-identity. Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, of course, Etsy is known for personalization. If you want something that shows your personality or your self-identity, just message the seller and she would see what she can do for you. In these examples I have on this page, we have wedding mask, we have dog mask, of course, for the pet lovers, and we even have fake face mask that look like you. So long after cloth masks were available at any number of e-commerce stores, Etsy mask sales continue to be very strong. And in large part, because people wanted to express their self-identity, even when others couldn't see their facial expressions. And the results have been pretty amazing. In 2020, mass sales added $743 million or 13% of our total sales. And while Etsy certainly benefited from the rise of e-commerce, which was about 40% last year, we outpaced that growth significantly in triple digit. And in part, that was thanks to mask and the power of customer misbehavior. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, any um, questions can still continue to be put in the Q&A. There are no active ones there right now, but I, we do have one hand raised. So Mike, I'm gonna allow that person to ask a question. Um, so, okay, I think it's Babukar, um, your question. You should be able to unmute and, and ask. Okay.
Did you still have a question you wanted to ask Mike or, or Youngjin or Kali? Okay, well, maybe move on to the next one. Um, Ted, Ladd, question for Mike. Hi, Mike. Ted Ladd, um, case 20, PhD 2016. Um, can you give examples on Etsy or anywhere else where that allowance of an open platform allowing users to do as they choose has has failed? Where does this go awry? Yeah, Ted, super nice to meet you. Congratulations um, on completing the program. Great question. I think, you know, throughout the research and especially in writing the book for practitioners, the area that we saw this get sort of, you know, too close to the edge and the wheels start falling off was when it became anything that, you know, bridged toward the illegal, immoral, unethical, that type of thing, that there are boundaries. So even when we say let people misuse the product, right? Some of the deeper research that we, you know, that we talk about or the, the way we apply this is by observing. And one of the um, you know, great things about our digital products today is how much instrumentation we have in them. You know, as an example, at Etsy, we have over, we collect over 6 billion events a day. So we, we track all types of data, you know, on everything from how difficult it is for the sellers to, to upload and list things to how, you know, how easy it is for the buyers to find and sell. And with all that, it's super easy to start watching. What does the customer really do with, you know, the old sort of way of doing this was asking customers, um, you know, what would, you know, what would you like to do? And it's always easy for them to tell you this, uh, but you observe them. And so it's really important to start observing them. But in that observation, again, to, you know, just to answer a question that the key is not letting them go into areas that, you know, either doesn't fit your mission or, you know, of course it gets into anything that's illegal, um, anything like that. That's where the misuse goes too far. Thanks for the question, I appreciate it. Thank you for the answer. Kali, you had a question? Or no, you I don't, don't, oh. no, don't want to take the floor at this stage. Okay, are there any other questions for, for Mike, for Young Jin? I don't see any in the Q&A. So Kali, why don't you, um, Go ahead and move on to the next part, if you will. And uh, thank you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so uh, at this part, we will provide you some some uh, information uh, about the program itself uh, uh, and what is the magic which produces results and uh, outcomes like what uh, Mike just presented. Um, uh, just some background of the program. Uh, we are. Uh, pretty well established program. We were established in 1995. So um, the last year we uh, had our 25 year uh, anniversary. And we were also the pioneer in the field in the sense that in North America, we were the first program of this kind uh, with the three year, uh, uh, at least 54 credit unit program with the thesis as an output. And which was practitioner oriented research program. Now it is uh, 64. We were also the, the first one to introduce and innovate around residency-based program, which uh, carries out uh, a relatively serious and significant research mission. And the one which also involves interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, uh, courses and coursework. So it's not focused on, for example, leadership. There had been some practice around the programs before that, which just focused on leadership. Uh, the idea behind the, uh, the program is that it's cohort based. Uh, so we, want, we in, in involve uh, working professionals, knowledge workers, uh, people in uh, senior leadership positions or similar types of positions in, uh, in, any, uh, in different settings and cover both uh, for profit, non profit, and also NGOs. 
Uh, and uh, we, we wanted to also make very uh, diverse and heterogeneous. So we have had uh, from the start uh, uh, students in the cohorts from different parts of the United States, North America, and also abroad. So we have had students from Europe, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and so forth. Um, this is a program for uh, experienced uh, uh, managers, uh, working managers and professionals. So which, uh, we expect uh, typically about 15 years of experience. So average age is 46 and standard deviation around that is probably around four years. So most of the people are uh, between 52, uh, 55 and uh, 40 in that rates. Um, and we have ad, uh, ac uh, admitted uh, about uh, 20 plus minus two students uh, uh, per each year. Some cohorts have been a little bit far larger, some have been a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, the prog uh, prog uh, just a, a little bit about the back also about this that uh, we, uh, this is now we are starting to, I think 27th cohort and so far we have been producing uh, over 300 alumni so this we have really large and the, by far the largest alumni base of any doctoral management program in, in the US. Uh, the, the coursework uh, is 18 credit hours per year, which is divided like nine credit hours per semester, which means three courses per semester. And on top of that, you have to do the research work, which is the remaining six credit hours, which uh, amounts for the thesis work, which is part of the uh, uh, degree. The tuition is currently 52,000 per year and uh, 26,000 per semester. Uh, it doesn't include travel or lodging that comes, uh, is also have to be covered. Uh, and it is a serious program, and we want to always estimate it. Uh, whether it's a part-time or not, we can argue about it, but uh, that uh, expected uh, uh, effort to put uh, by the student during the program uh, uh, course is about 30 hours per week. Uh, of course, exclusive residency sections, then you will be putting 100% uh, of the time in, into this program. And uh, uh, in the application process, we will be asking this question and we ask students to be uh, clearly thinking about it, that then can they organize their work and other activities in a way that they can uh, organize, uh, get this 30 hours a week uh, allocated to the study. Uh, we do also, uh, after the uh, program assessment of the time spent, and uh, students you know, always say that was, that was pretty much the right. Some say that it was little less, some say most of them say it was actually more. Of course, this is not distributed in um, uh, even, even manner. Sometimes it's 10 hours, sometimes it's 40 to 50 hours when, when the, it's a crust time and you have to get the research project finished and so forth. We also offer scholarship. Um, and it's about 20, 10 to 20% of the tuition discount. And it is mostly for nonprofits. Uh, people who come from a nonprofit sector um, or public sector. Uh, and, we, uh, and this is also to promote the heterogeneity, want to have the program. This is a management program, not just a business program. So we want to have uh, uh, students who uh, come from different fields of uh, organizations where you have different types of management issues and problems. Um, another uh, feature of this program is that uh, uh, as I pointed out, it has an interdisciplinary curriculum. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, offer any courses which focus on functions, uh, classical functions, marketing, uh, strategy, and so forth. We have courses where we cover certain aspects of marketing or customer experience or uh, strategy, where we look at industrial organization. Another aspect of that is that uh, uh, throughout the whole study, we integrate theory and practice. So we start with the practical problems of the students, that's where the, which drives the research, but we integrate that over time across different theories and also all the coursework integrates theory and practice. They involve also, also practical engagements. Uh, we also emphasize all types of evidence. So this is an example of evidence-based management in the sense that we uh, uh, deploy analytics and different types of inferential techniques to extract meaningful and valid insights for management action. And, uh, the key aspect of the program, we have about nine courses in different types of methods, is to learn and build the skills to apply qualitative and quantitative research me methods and related uh, forms of uh, making inferences from uh, available evidence, which are valuable across different types of management settings. 
And these uh, offer uh, ways of building much competence for more effective uh, problem solving, which means capability to see the issue situation from multiple angles and using multiple type of evidence to make uh, uh, recommendations or understand situations, what are the best ways of intervening in those situations. And, we all, and uh, finally, we focus on research that matters. So uh, if all the research which has been conducted has been uh, driven by the uh, back practical needs and insights of the students and what they wanted to do and what they felt was important in their practice. You heard just uh, how much research started from this practical experience of scaling on uh, social, uh, especially social networking platforms. And the question is that what drives that scaling and what are the reasons why some scale and some others don't? This is of course an important pro problem of practice, which he has been able to, later on to uh, apply these insights in his own managerial work. But uh, this just shows what type of research we wanna emphasize. Um, and this is pretty much it what I wanna say now. Uh, the website offers uh, tons of materials. It, it is a, a treasure trove of all types of evidence about the program, if you wanna look at that. There's a, a large number of um, student uh, testimonies, uh, we, we offer all the information about the uh, different courses, the, the course outlines, objectives, uh, li literature. We also uh, provide uh, access to most of the theses which have been produced over the years uh, in the program. They can be downloaded, you can look at them. So we want to be uh, totally transparent about what the, what the expectations about the skills and competencies are about the program and, what the, and also what the experience of the students who come to the program, what it is. So without further ado, if you have any additional questions or comments, I'm happy to engage those. Thank you. Hey, Kali, earlier when Mike was speaking, there was a question about, we have a, a guest here today that was interested in a PhD in accountancy. And I did say that there is a separate traditional PhD program in accountancy at Weatherhead, but that, they could be in the DBA and the executive PhD program and have a concentration in accountancy. Oh, yes, we have. Let, uh, I can say something about the general uh, composition of the cohort. Um, because it's interdisciplinary, you can say that, uh, and the education is interdisciplinary, but there's clearly a differential focus in terms of what type of research the students do and what they're in. And they're clearly separate groups. So. One large cohort is, which I would call sort of innovation and entrepreneurship um, uh, related strategies. That's what, what the example for I was in. Uh, it was largely about digital, digital technology innovation, but we have also had people who have been working on entrepreneurship strategy, um, uh, biotech innovation and things like that. Then we have a relatively large group which uh, focuses on leadership, leadership behaviors, and sustainability because we have the school has a very strong and famous OB group and also sustainability organizational change group. Then we have always a two to three uh, accountants or behavioral finance people. We have always two to three marketing people. So overall, the, the cohort is uh, relatively heterogeneous, which we find is actually extremely valuable experience for the students because they are they will also learn from the students and what they do and research they do what their uh, personal experience and professional experiences all that also shines and gets shared actually across the, throughout the program um Kali also we had um somebody that asked Lauren Miller that asked um for you to repeat just for a moment what you said about the alumni network I in the Q&A mentioned our alumni council, and then I also mentioned the engaged practitioner scholar fellowships, but uh, you had mentioned something about the alumni network and if you wanted to repeat or expand on that. Well, I will uh, say that, yes, we have, huh, we have a, a, a alumni network, uh, currently about 309, I think we will be around 320 X something uh, after this, this May and probably in 350 in a couple of years. Um, and it's the largest uh, of this type in, in North America, probably one of the largest in the world. Um, and one characteristics, of course, is that it has this heterogeneity uh, of all the students who have come through the program. 
but there's also certain benefits from being and going through this program. As, as I said, we, we offer uh, also alumni activities and alumni interactions through uh, events and other types of uh, activities like research support and the research groups. But also when you are a student uh, as part of the program, many of the alumni help the students to go through the program. For example, finding research sites, offering mentoring, uh, or offering other types of things. And we have also uh, found that the alumni actually help in many other ways, which have nothing to necessarily to do with actual study. So they offer you, they, these become networks through which you can find new jobs, you can find new uh, customers, you can find all types of, uh, uh, even financial consulting and help or some other things. I, I know that all these have happened through certain types of uh, alumni interactions. Great, thanks, Kali. Um, Young Jin, um, can you maybe address for the group uh, what can students expect from your course on technology and social social systems design? Uh, so it's a third year class, uh, so it's a kind of like a, a extension of another course on that topic in the second year. Uh, where uh, students learn about uh, design and, uh, you know, artifacts and, you know, how we think about, uh, you know, technology in general in an organization from human-centric perspective. The, my class uh, is uh, taking it to uh, the next level and looking at some of the uh, issues uh, around how can we create uh, sustainable organizations uh, with technology and, and um, you may have, uh, you know, guessed I'm uh, uh, quite interested in the um, the evolutionary aspect. You know, the the one that is uh, strong and and sustaining are something that is living. Uh, you know, so how you uh, creating a sustainable organization is also understanding the evolutionary trajectory and forces of the uh, you know um, the organizations over time. Um, so uh, that's what, uh, you know, the course is about. There are, uh, you know, a couple of books we read, a lot of articles, and, you know, uh, also uh, try to uh, introduce some of the computational, uh, new computational methods that, uh, uh, that could be helpful in understanding the uh, complex evolutionary patterns of changes in routines and products and services and platforms. Uh, so that, those are some of the topics we cover and, and students apply those ideas in their own research. Some of them uh, look at uh, from more like IT and innovation and technology perspective, but others look at it from like identity. So people think about identity as an evolving, um, you know, um, group or organizational identity as an evolving construct and, you know, emergent construct, how, uh, you know, they may uh, approach it in a different way. Uh, and so forth. So. Great, Young Jin, thank you. Sounds like a terrific class. Um, any last minute questions for Kali, Young Jin, or any of us? I think I'm up to date in the Q&A, and I think I've reached anyone that had raised their hand. But any last minute ones? So Kali, if you wanna bring it home then. <laughs> right. All right, I would like to thank you all of you who attended this uh, webinar and we hope that it was useful uh, in two ways. First, that it uh, uh, excited some and incited some new ideas uh, about digital technologies and the use and how to innovate around it. Uh, and provide, and uh, secondly, that it could provide you some sense of what the program experience is going to look like, what types of teaching and what the faculty are going to teach and what types of things you, you are capable of achieving uh, by going through the program. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you and uh, interacting with you, with you in the future. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll be closing this session now. Thank you. <laughs>